All right. Welcome to the Adventures in Brain Injury Podcast. My name is Kevin Ballister. I'm a severe traumatic brain injury survivor. I'm actually at my boy's warehouse in Miami on another adventure. I, I was in Colorado and then I went to Orlando for the International Symposium on Clinical Neuroscience. And now I'm here. I um, actually recorded this episode in Colorado. So, um, yeah, while I was at Revive Treatment Centers. And I, uh, I'm really excited to bring this episode to you. So while I was in Houston, I don't know, a couple, basically at the beginning of May, um, I went to the Epic Functional Medicine Conference, which is really just so many amazing practitioners doing really good work. And they know their stuff about, about human health, about biochemistry, about how physiology works. And it's really, really amazing to meet so many of these guys. So one of them is Dr. Robert Silverman, who's a chiropractor in New York. And he kind of stole the show. He's really smart, has, um, has a lot of personality behind what he's talking about and really useful information the whole way down the line. So you're going to love this one. Um, I want to thank my listeners, especially those who are leaving reviews for the podcast. That makes a huge difference in getting this information out there. Um, and I also want to, uh, I mean, you know, I, I want to I read one of them. Okay, got one. This is a review from Brittany Chan. Uh, she says, excellent and valuable resource. I stumbled upon this podcast a few weeks ago, and I've been hooked on it. Kevin's personal account of his experience with brain injury is phenomenal and definitely inspiring. As a TBI survivor of 11 years myself, this podcast has helped me in gaining a better self-awareness and understanding the types of resources available to me. As a newly graduated PTA who desires to have a career focus around neuro rehab, this podcast is an invaluable resource for understanding the whole patient process from the clinician's viewpoint. Thank you to all involved in providing this outstanding and informative collection of interviews. Thank you for that, Brittany. It's my pleasure to get these out there and your review makes a huge difference in it reaching more people. So thank you. I intend to continue doing what I'm doing. And uh, anybody else who can leave a review, super appreciated. Um, Brittany, find me on Instagram or, yeah, let's do Instagram, Feed a Brain or Cavin B. Just send me a message there and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get a book out to you. I also want to let you know that I'm working with clients really intensely at this point. Um, and uh, I have consultations available. If you're a listener of my podcast, also contact me on Instagram and let me know you're interested in a consultation. We can chat a little bit or go to feedobrain.com forward slash consult for more information. Um, I'm just going to hop into this interview. I, I want to warn you for a moment. It does get kind of heady. It has a lot of information that we cover quickly. And while Dr. Silverman is fantastic at breaking down science into understandable terms, um, we get kind of rushed at the end and didn't really have too much time. So we were trying to squeeze a lot of things in there. Um, and it might be a little a little heavy over over your head or or maybe not you know and um let me know what you think about it and i'm thinking about doing a more um higher level podcast as well as the adventures in brain injury podcast so i'd love to hear your feedback about this interview that's about it y'all let's jump into it so, Dr. Robert Silverman, man, it is a pleasure to have you here. Um, you know, I saw you at the Epic Functional Medicine Conference with uh, Biotics Research, which was epic. It was awesome. And you were kind of the highlight, for sure. So, Thanks. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so like, and well, I shouldn't say that. Dr. Vasquez was too. He's like, he's like my, the whole reason I was there. And it was, it was just he's amazing. A, he's a genius. I don't mean to interrupt oh, you, but he, he's at the top of the yeah. shelf. Genius man. Yep. He was, he's like my mentor. So essentially you might not know this, Robert, but, uh, but as I was recovering, you know, I'm relearning how to eat, walk and talk my left hand as I'm working, but we have the internet. So I'm able to, uh, to watch videos, listen to podcasts. Uh, I learned how to read peer reviewed research and I stumbled on Dr. Vasquez's videos that he, he's an adjunct professor for Bastyr at the time. And he had online resources that he made available to his students. And um, so I got to watch those. And then I reached out to him to thank him. And I told him a little bit about myself. And I showed him my, uh, my blog. And he was like, man, we, the International Conference on Human Nutrition and Functional Medicine is coming up in a few months. You should come. And I was like, yeah. So I came. And while I was at that conference, I, he was like, we have an entire day dedicated to the brain. So while I was at that conference, um, it was on the brain day. Dr. V was like, hey, I'm grabbing coffee. You want to come? And I'm like, yeah, of course. And then he's like, so what was the number one most effective therapy you did for your brain after your injury? And I said, honestly, Alex, healing my digestion was what made all the other therapies effective. And we'll talk about that for sure. We're on the same page there. And he was like, and we started to talk about the gut-brain axis, you know, stuff that I learned from him and others, um, others in the field. And he, uh, he said, wow, you know, we need, we need you on stage. How do you feel about being on stage in about uh, 20 minutes? And so the next thing I knew, I was on stage speaking to a bunch of practitioners about um about brain nutrition and and gut health for brain health so i know we're going to talk a lot about that because you're all over that all over it my friend your story is so compelling and i'm so happy you're doing so well and it's my honor to be here and um it was great to meet you and thank you for those uh initial kudos on epic and uh i do appreciate that we got some good reviews on that and it's exciting you know biotics is a great company and Epic was a, um, a really, really uh, leading edge type of uh, symposium where a lot of people could learn and correlate the information that some leading experts mm -hmm. um, shared. And I'm happy you were imbued with enthusiasm yes. to uh, get me on here. Yes, 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 absolutely. So actually, Alex invited me to Epic. And I feel so honored to have that opportunity. So uh, another shout out to Dr. Vasquez. Thank you, my man. Um, so first of all, man, how did you get into uh, chiropractic care? You know, uh, my, my story is real simple. Uh, getting into chiropractic, it was not something that I initially thought to get into. Um, uh, I have what they call congenital torticollis. I have an asymmetry in the neck. Right. You know, I grew up in New York City in a kind of like tough area. So I'm that was a lot for a moment. So, so torticollis, that's like, uh, it's like where your neck's kind of like this. Sure, okay. exactly that, torticollis or what they would call wry neck. So that's congenital at birth. Um, there wasn't much we could do at that time because I was born in the 60s and it was a very strong medical model. Chiropractic wasn't popular or even uh, thought or talked about at the time. Yeah, so at 18 years old, I went to a, an elite pediatrician. The pediatrician suggested two options. Option number one was surgery to neck, pull the muscles apart. They didn't have any good clinical outcome studies, and he guaranteed me a scar. So we were very, um, we weren't really enthusiastic. I wouldn't be too enthusiastic about somebody yeah. slitting my throat or cutting me. That, that was it, especially when it's near the carotid artery. Although I, I, did, have a, I did have a surgery to my trachea Ooh. Um, where they slit my throat to save my life. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Go on, I'm sorry. Well, no, no worries, no worries. Number two was <laughs> chiropractic. So I went to chiropractic, and the first time I went to a chiropractor at 18 years old, it was not the greatest uh, experience. It was actually maybe the worst experience I've ever had with the doctor. However, at 21 years old, I went to a chiropractor who now is a patient of mine also, still practicing chiropractic about a mile from me, and you know the, the lights went off, the star-spangled banner, all that kind of stuff. It was great. He talked to me. 
He told me what he could do. I felt better. And I got up off the table. I was a business major in a business school and said, I want to be a chiropractor. So I finished uh, school, got a job offer from IBM, worked the morning, left at lunch, never came back, went and enrolled in all the prereqs that you needed for chiropractic school, then went to chiropractic school and been trying to race ahead ever since because I got the greatest job in the world. I get the opportunity to make impactful change in people's lives via health every day. Yes. Now, you would have thought I would have had a chiro uh, chiropractic practice that really um, did a lot more torticollis, but no, mine initially was a musculoskeletal, and it then became sports and musculoskeletal. Then it became sports, musculoskeletal, and nutrition, always doing nutrition. First thing we did was weight loss. Great stuff. Ultimately, the reason I got where I am right now was the only real way I was able to truly make the impact and fix the body from the inside out, book number one, Inside Out Health, was very simply by looking at the we'll difference. put that in the links. You put that in the links. Thanks yeah. so much. Uh, was to get inside the body and start looking at the systems. And without question, the super highway to health is the gut to brain axis, the brain to gut axis. And you know that as well as anybody because you're living that recovery every day. But yours is very pertinent serious where some other people don't even understand the pertinency or how serious the gut is. They still have it. Oh, really? It's real simple. I'll ask all your listeners out there. If you have gas and bloating, do you ever get brain fog? If you do, you probably have a compromise of the gut to brain, the brain to gut axis. And it's mm -hmm. something that you want to take care of. And the reason is 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. It's yes. where your macro, your foods and your micro nutrients are absorbed. So what have you done for your guts lately? You have the guts to be healthy. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I'm actually on the road right now. I've been uh, I've been kind of on the road a lot, and my immune system has been run down. And I'm just getting over a little something. And my course of treatment, anytime I feel something coming on, I open up a, a high quality probiotic, like with the, like a capsule with powder, and I put it at the back of my throat, and I hold it there for a while, so it's getting up in my sinuses. Uh -huh. I'm getting in my lungs, like all of that, and repopulating the gut flora as well as other intake forms of, uh, you know, our body brings in stuff from the outside, mainly through our digestion, mainly through our, our gut. Also, the air we breathe, that's huge, it's probably more, more so than the gut. And then also through the, uh, through what we absorb in our skin. Am I missing anything? No, you got all the barriers. So what you really did is, you know, you said the gut to braid is important, but all these barriers. So the skin is a barrier. Do you have leaky skin? Your, lu your lungs are barriers. All these epithelial, um, I am now um, shutting that off. Sorry, I had a little tech thing there. So all these epithelial barriers are, are quite important because they're sort of the, uh, the barrier between the outside and the inside of your body. It's so interesting. We know if we rip the skin, we put a Band-Aid on. But if we rip our gut, which is so common, we don't even consider putting a Band-Aid on. And it takes nine months for the average person to re and regrow their epithelial linings in your gut. Mm -hmm. The real question is when you work with a patient, the question is, can you detect the barriers and can you remove the triggers that are damaging the barriers? Yes. Yes. So number one, heal the digestion. And that's, yeah. Yeah, so the analogy I use is, is thinking of uh, many connections in my brain have been damaged. And I think of rebuilding those connections like building a bridge or building any connections like building a bridge. What do you need? You need supplies and you need skilled workers. Supplies would be the uh, nutrition, the right kind of nutrition. But also you need to get that supplies to the construction site. So you need the roads to be fixed, which is your digestion. You need to be able to deliver the supplies to the site. Absolutely. It's great. And, and those supplies, supplements are critical, but the starting supply for everything is food because mm -hmm. food is a potentiator for inflammation. Food is a potentiator for health. Food is your ability for your body to communicate. If our bodies were race cars, Fuel and oil would be the type of food. The alignment of the, the tires would be the chiropractic alignment. Mm. And then ultimately, everything that we do will shine through and that'll be like the paint and the varnish on the outside. 
So if you look at it like that, you would never, ever, ever put fuel in a, in a race car that wasn't the most premium fuel. So why do people do it when you, you can always replace a car if there's insurance on it, but you can't replace your body? Jim Rome once said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. Mm. Who said that? Jim Rome. I Tony love it. Robbins. Yeah, yeah Tony Rome. Robbins. Jim Rome. That's right. Yeah, somebody was like, are you a picky eater? And I'm like, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm very choosy about what my body is fueled with. Sure. Um, is it a problem? No. Do I let it be a problem? Not really. Um, not at all. I'd let it, I, I, like I say in my book, the healthiest thing we can do for our brains, bodies, and souls is to enjoy our life and to do so sustainably. And I would add, and to do so with the people we love. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And I try, and what I share with everybody here and I tell my patients is health is a great investment. Don't make it a checking account, make it a savings account. I love it. Nice. Nice. Very good, man. So, all right. We're talking about the microbiome mm -hmm. um, effect. How does that, like we talked about how it affects our immune health. What, what else? How does the microbiome affect health and disease? That's a, that's a great question. So our microbiome is really speaking to what's going on in our gut, but let, let's, let's use the right term. So microbiome is everything. The microbiota is what's going on in your, in your gut. So your microbiota, your bacteria. Now remember, we have more bacteria in our body, 100 times more than we do in, in cells in our body. So we're really more bacteria than anything else, and it outweighs us. It's living. It's three pounds. That microbiota speaks to our gut, what we call connectium. So the bacteria is actually a signaler and a communicator with our gut then through specific systems. One of the systems, believe it or not, interestingly enough, is what we call the vagus nerve. That vagus nerve is your cranial nerve number 10. It's your parasympathetic system modulator or truly your end, end, um, enteric nervous system uh, captain. And the enteric nervous system, that nervous system has more nerve cells in the body and that actually is your digestive nervous system. This vagus nerve can get stimulated between the gut and the brain, and it can communicate. Its proper, proper function is anti-inflammation. So, so I want to clarify what you just said. Yeah, I hope I didn't go off on a tangent. No, no, no. Uh, could you repeat? You were saying something about how the enteric nervous system has more, um, more ner nerves than any other system. So right. your digestive system. The captain of your digestive system, the nerves, or your enteric nervous system, there's more nerve cells there than any other nervous system. And people don't remember that. It's one of the reasons that we call our gut our second brain. Mm -hmm. But really, our gut should be our first brain because your gut communicates much more going up to your brain than mm -hmm. your brain coming down. Four to five times more communication going up than going down. And when you're a fetus, your gut and your brain are together. So truly, even though we call it our second brain, it's our first brain. Mm. It right. It's the first brain. one that, 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 you know, that is developed in utero, correct? Absolutely. And I didn't mean to digress. So no. basically the microbiota communicates with the gut. The gut communicates with the brain. The main communication is this vagus nerve, the bidirectionality. You mm. also can communicate through your bloodstream and you also can communicate through your immune system. So you have three specific ways that your gut can communicate with your brain. And now that we're talking about this, when I say we, now the generation is starting to talk about this. This is opening us up to taking care of the body from the inside, which is what we do. Somebody asked me the other day, what kind of doctor are you? And I said, well, let me tell you what a good doctor will do for you. He'll give you your reflection in the mirror of health. I hope to be the doctor that not only can give you the reflection, but change your reflection in the mirror. Mm. And the only way you're going to do that is to fix the systems inside. Right. Yeah. You said something about that. You also said um, a, an, an awesome quote. You said, the brain we nurture determines the life we lead. Yeah, the brain we nurture does determine the life we lead because the brain we develop from the Dalai Lama um, is the life that we lead. So I changed it a little bit, Dalai Lama, with all due respect, we changed it. We got to nurture our brain. You know, what, what have you done for your brain lately? Do you know that when you exercise, one of the biggest reasons you exercise is to stimulate your brain? 
Your brain as an organ responds better than any other organ in your body from exercise. So all these people, when they talk about concussion, rest, do this, do that, right. the literature does not bear it out. They've got to look at the literature. The literature changed over three years ago. Mm. And if you need some leading edge information, this is the podcast that you want because I know who you're getting on. And everybody that you're putting on is now talking about what's now and in the future. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about what's past. Past mm -hmm. can be prologue, but it should be prologue for the future. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And what you said about exercise, actually, I'm at a neuro rehabilitation clinic right now that I work with um, revived treatment centers here in Denver. And I was like, all right, I'm going to be on a podcast in about 20 minutes. And I, I grabbed uh, uh, one of the therapists here and I'm like, let's do some work. Let's do some work. Let's get my heart rate going, you know? So we started doing some martial arts stuff that I'm working on. Um, I'm working to rehabilitate my balance and my kicks and like self-defense and whatnot. And there, there are like, there are a couple things that have been really important in my recovery. One of them being yoga, another being jujitsu. And, uh, and the other being dance, all super important, integrating the body and the mind and, and it really exciting the brain, you know, and, and that, that hones your focus. It's awesome. Absolutely. To piggyback on what you just said, the body's all interconnected. So that was beautiful. And the reason the gut to brain axis is so important is that if your gut isn't in pristine condition and things pass your gut, and I think we'll get into that a little bit, it affects all your other systems. And to speak to your brain, and nobody knows this better than you for what you've been through, unfortunately. And again, kudos for you for on your way on this comeback trail. It's great. It's very inspiring to me. But with that being said, your brain is the only organ that communicates with everything else. So it's the chip of your body. It's kind of like a computer. And it kind of like puts everything in. So that's why you'll see, as we talk of different systems, all what we call the afferent going in and the afferent going in, afferent going up to the brain is much mm -hmm. more than the brain going out. You can't do anything without your brain. You can't live without a brain. Now, who's the guy that didn't have the brain in the Wizard of Oz? <laughs> that was the scarecrow, was right? I have somebody scarecrow. here. That was the yeah, scarecrow. Yeah, yeah. So it's the only spot I've ever seen, you know, for <laughs> But somebody lived without a brain. And that guy could sing and dance and he man was away. <laughs> I was watching that a little while ago with my niece. And I remember watching it with my mom. And my mom told me she remembers watching it with her mom. So it's one of those things. But nevertheless, he did not have a brain. The scarecrow is the only guy that can live without it. <laughs> if I only had a brain. If I only had a brain. So, um, you know, you talked about... Uh, we're talking about brain injury and I wanted to bring this up because it's really interesting is why do you think it is that we have um, more female brain injuries reported and more, and it seems to be uh, uh, harder to rehabilitate after brain injury for females. Well, women get more brain injuries and it's precisely they get more concussions. And the reason they get more concussions is a fourfold problem. Problem number one, they have a tendency to report injury more than their male counterparts. I don't Number think that's a problem. It's not a problem, but that's <laughs> one of the reasons that there's documentation. Totally, totally, totally. So, number two, their upper body neck muscles are not as strong as their male counterparts pound for pound. So, they whip back and forth more. The whip, this whipping, and especially whipping from contact from the side leads to more of a shear. So what we found out, concussion, the damage is the shear and the shaking back and forth and the muscles protect the neck from the shear. So the females, unfortunately, their muscles aren't quite as strong, more of an impact, more shear, more brain damage. Their recovery is slower because of two reasons, something called withdrawal hypotheses or their um, withdrawal hypotheses pertaining to damage of the pituitary gland or aberrant flow of the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is damaged after a concussion. And unfortunately, progesterone is decreased. Progesterone should be very high in women in their, two, their last two weeks of their cycle. Progesterone's main feature or function is to enable the woman to have mental clarity and to recover and heal their brain. When they have a concussion, progesterone goes down, 
than I'm able to recover from the impact and the extra shearing puts them down on this precipitous path of damage to the brain and slow recovery. And last, most interesting, and it's a little techie, but it's time to geek out. There's something called microglial cells in your central nervous system. Microglial cells are actually macrophages. Macrophages in your body are the captain of information. They actually go around and decide, do I continue with inflammation or do I resolve from inflammation? Microglials are those macrophages in your central nervous system. Your central nervous system being your spine and your brain. Women, microglial systems act differently than men because they have something called an estrogen beta receptor. With that being said, their estrogen beta receptor switches microglials to be very deleterious to the particular area. So essentially, these microglial cells can go from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, clean up cellular debris, come back in women and not switch back, and then do an adverse damage or injurious damage to structures in your central nervous system. That would be the fourth reason that women have this issue with concussion. In addition, women are more susceptible to Alzheimer's. About 70% of the people have Alzheimer's, which is neurodegenerative disease. They have more susceptibility. We're not a heart. We don't know why yet. We just know the numbers bear that mm -hmm. out. Okay. So a little bit of correlation mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. with neurodegenerative diseases and brain injury, which makes sense because essentially neurodegenerative diseases look very, very much like brain injury looks or vice versa. Absolutely. So a brain injury, let's do concussion, traumatic brain injury, can damage the blood-brain barrier. Now, everybody asks me to define the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a single-layer system, the same single-layer system that your gut is made out of, or at least your small intestine. That single-layer system actually allows for 400 miles of arterial mm -hmm. flow to the brain. And what does it do, the blood-brain barrier? It's the barrier between the bloodstream and the brain. The brain does not have direct access to blood. It has to go through this blood-brain barrier. It needs this filter to protect itself from pathogens and toxins. When you damage the blood-brain barrier, which is very common in concussion in other conditions, the blood-brain barrier, which I've nicknamed the bouncer of the brain, opens up the door to the brain, things attack, you go inside your brain, hence the decrease of, or excuse me, the increase of neurodegenerative disease. Mm -hmm. Yes. So after my injury, and after anybody has a brain injury, you have a compromised blood-brain barrier. Like, is, that's, that's broken down. And so toxins anywhere in your body are able to enter into your brain, which can cause inflammation and all, I mean, all sorts of damage because you don't have an intact blood-brain barrier. And when you don't have an intact blood-brain barrier, you don't have an intact gut-brain barrier either. So there's, there's studies showing how, how concussion almost always leads to intestinal permeability or leaky gut. Um, which is where your gut lining is not is not um, is not functioning correctly, and let's let's talk a little bit about leaky gut. What would you go for it? Yeah, do you want to just jump in? Let's jump in. One thing All that right. you said that was great. What you do to your brain, you do to your body. What you do to your brain, you do to your gut. What you also said was when you damage your brain, you damage your gut. Correct. With it, Brown University has done a study. And within six hours after a concussion, brain cells start to die. Within six hours, your tight junctions, which are um, your, sort of your gateway between your epithelial cells in your gut, that single layer system, they begin to open up. And three hours after concussion, you have the increase of what we call LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Mm -hmm. We'll hold there, and then we're going to pick up at lipopolysaccharide, and you'll see the combination. Leaky gut. Let me hop in with a little clarification. Sure. So what what we have is like is a leak is is a intestinal lining. Let's imagine this is the intestinal lining. Uh, For those who are that. listening, like you can't really see this, but what I'm doing is I'm interlacing my fingers. 
and you have the inside of the gut lining, there's there's food and nutrients and uh, partially digested food particles. And as those are broken down into digested food particles, they cross the the tight junctions uh, past the epithelial, which is which is lining single cellular cellular. You know, it's not that important. It goes into the blood. That's what's important as digested food particles. And the blood takes those digested food particles and it goes, oh, I know what this is. This is a glucose, or this is a amino acid, or this is a fatty acid, and it'll take it and bring it through the through the body, through you know, to give the body nutrients with and brain nutrients. With leaky gut, this becomes permeable and now whole food particles cross into the bloodstream undigested, which, you know, when the blood sees an undigested food particle in there it goes whoa what's that like we need to we need to clean that up it acts the same way if you had a splinter or something right like the wood has nutrients in it but your your body doesn't care it's like we gotta we gotta i mean your body can't digest it your gut can digest it so an immune response happens what happens when you have a splinter it gets red and swollen it's painful all of that happens um, as a result of of leaky gut. Go That's on. great. I think I think the splinter is a great example. So it was excellent. You know, talking about our gut should be semi permeable, like you said. Food, nutrients, and water should be able to pass. But things like undigested food particles, specific bacteria and viruses, shouldn't. When the gut becomes leaky, those things pass, like you said. And when they pass, your body's immune system goes on alert because mm -hmm. they're not supposed to be there. So the foreign concept, it's foreign. Mm -hmm. So the immune system is your defense mechanism and it attacks it, just mm -hmm. like you said with a splinter. So the technical definition is the antigen, which is like that undigested food particle passing, antibodies coming from immunoglobins attack, and you've got that inflammatory process. The problem with that is that a lot of times that, that system gets confused. And when it gets confused, it starts to attack you. We call that molecular mm -hmm. mimicry, but the end result is autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. So your permeability of your gut is the first step towards autoimmunity. And mm -hmm. neurodegeneration in your brain, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, lupus, these are all autoimmune diseases mm. so, so this resonates with everybody it's so amazing how how digestion is such a huge aspect of all this and um looking at your accolades you have so much in nutrition and understanding nutrition so much because man it makes such a huge difference and you talked a little bit about lipopolysaccharides and I want our audience to understand what that is. So how would you describe uh, LPS? L lipopolysaccharides, LPS is the acronym. LPS is on the inside of the intestinal membrane, but on the outer portion of the membrane. It actually holds, here's your inside of your gut. LPS is here on the outer membrane holding gram-negative bacteria like E. coli against there. So when LPS is expressed through the pathway, it causes systemic inflammation, and you're also releasing the gram-negative bacteria. That E. coli, which everybody knows, which resonates with them, isn't very healthy. LPS is the IV on the cell wall. Mm. And LPS is an inflammatory marker. Systemic inflammatory yes. marker that can lead you down a path of damaging multiple organ systems, most commonly the brain. <sighs> Yep. So we want to move. We want to avoid that. LPS is a bad dude. Bad you, dude. You don't want to release LPS. Absolutely. And then it it's sort of like a jailbreak. It's the one bad dude that releases all the gram negative bacteria. And now you've got this plethora of bad guys running around and you're just trying to play catch up in your health. Awesome. You know, something else I found very interesting about your talk was uh, you introduced touring as, as oh, yeah. something to add to a concussion protocol. Could you expand on that? Yeah, taurine, a great amino acid. So what happens is in the brain, when you have damage to the brain, you activate the NAMR receptor site. So what happens is glutamate, 
And glutamate is released when there's something called excitotoxicity in the brain. Glutamate is released in abundance. By glutamate opening up that receptor site, it allows for calcium to go from extracellular to intracellular. When it does that, the calcium now plaques, leading you down a, a path of adverse health. Also what's released is potassium. Potassium inside the cell, great. Energy for axons. Outside the cell, damages the axons. So taurine blocks the release of glutamate, therefore blocking the increased absorption of calcium. So taurine is a critical element to add in a concussion, certainly if people are on a gut protocol, because if you're on a gut protocol, the most abundant amino acid in the bloodstream is glutamine, and glutamine is commonly taken, but glutamine increases the release of glutamate. Taurine mm. blocks glutamate, not allowing calcium to go in, the cell potassium to go out. Taurine is a hidden gem for overall brain health. Right. And, and you know, glutamine is often part of a gut healing protocol. Without it, question. Yes. So it heals up the gut, but you're saying that glutamine stimulates glutamate that, yeah. that can increase, uh, it was the intracellular calcium? Intracellular calcium. So it's calcium inside the cells. And then you also talked about potassium. Right, um, potassium comes outside the cell. On the outside of the cell, yeah. right. When Healthy, the calcium, calcium goes outside, up. damages axons. Gotcha, yeah. So we, taurine helps mitigate that quite a bit. That's awesome. Great. That's Great really stuff. good to know. Really great stuff. That's awesome. So what are some other environmental triggers that affect the gut-brain axis? Well, environmental triggers, which usually damage the gut, uh, the brain axis, and the gut and the brain barriers, would be like something like BPA. Actually, uh, phthalates. These are all things in plastics. But the one I always love to talk about environmental, without question, would be Roundup or glyphosate mm -hmm. and Roundup. So glyphosate actually damages and kills the microvilli in the gut. The microvilli are shaggy carpets. They're actually little claws almost that grab your nutrients. So they damage your gut. They can cause leaky gut. It also can damage your brain. Glyphosate is used in all our non-organic soils. And glyphosate, our non-organic soils, by the way, are 93%. And glyphosate is actually used in organic, but they use it as an antibiotic because it cleans out everything. Mm. So a tremendous environmental would be that. So glyphosate is an herbicide. We in America use 80% of the world's herbicides, pesticides, insecticides. Our environment is very, very adverse to our overall health. We've got to change the way that we raise our food or grow our food. We've got to take better care of our air. But the problem is the world that I lived in, I'm older than you, is not the same world in that you live in right now. And my parents, that was a totally different world. So the problem is that we're not really taking care of our environment and our ability to grow healthy food. That's why organic is so critical. Non-pesticide foods are critical for everybody's health from whatever ends of the two spectrums that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's difficult for people, you know, especially in rural America um, and in places where there's mm -hmm. like, you know, what, what I call a food desert, where it's just really, really, really hard to get um, high quality foods. And what you're what you're saying, if, if I understand this right, is even, even organic foods use glyphosate in some ways sometimes. Not That's all correct. organic foods, but, you know, you got to be very careful with that. Like, it's, so when, when, how do we know, you know, how do we know if, if a food is free of glyphosate all the way down the line? Our best option is either to know the farmer and or organic food. However, for everybody, I'm a big proponent on testing. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is we, what we what talked about earlier about ex removing the triggers and examining the barriers. Some of the biggest mistakes that people make is say, I just want to take a probiotic. No, what you want to do is you want to know what triggers you. See if you have food allergies, 
if your environment is causing you to have adverse reactions. And last but not least, maybe most important, is you should test the barriers. You should test your gut barrier, your blood-brain barrier. These tests are available, and they're not that all that expensive. Damage to the blood-brain barrier may be the first sign of Alzheimer's. In neurofilament light, uh, neurofilament light chain can dictate that you have Alzheimer's 16 years in advance. Now they're talking about another protein test that can tell you Alzheimer's 35 years in advance. So one of the first things that I would recommend everybody listening to is to take Alzheimer's tests. And those Alzheimer's tests are the APOE4. They can have variants. APOE2 is without question, if you have it, you're probably going to get Alzheimer's. Small amount of people have it. APO3. No problem. APOE4, most common variant. A minimum of 25% of Americans have that. Truly a percentage of them have Alzheimer's. So the conversation is now, let's start doing gene testing. Let's start doing barrier testing. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it gets, it gets tricky. I got you it. hooked on that one. <clears throat> I mean, the thing with the genetics is like, I, I really do not like thinking that uh, – that genetics are our destiny, right? And um, and of yeah. course, there's so and they're not. There's so much we can do to mitigate whatever. So like, um, if if somebody has a APOE2 uh, variant in their in their genes, it's like you're not necessarily going to get Alzheimer's, but you're very susceptible to it. So let's take care and make sure the environment is set up. So that you don't develop Alzheimer's. So your brain is in a much better place to be protected from such a thing. But yes, absolutely. So what are some of the, the tests um, for Alzheimer's that are not genetic? Well, I like those. The ones that I just mentioned, neurofilament light. There's a new spit test that's microRNA. So any and all of those will be true great markers to determine your susceptibility to Alzheimer's. And the protocol simple. Dale Bretson's got the best protocol out there. He talks about it. Let's start with food. Keep your carbohydrates low and keep your glycemic index under 35. Mm -hmm. Brain detox, which is a whole nother seminar. Brainwash your head. Terrific. When I say brainwash, it's truly washing your brain clean, allowing it to detox at night, not brainwashing it to make yourself a mass murderer. Um, That's what I say. I say we're brainwashed every night because our, our glimpse. Yeah, we are brainwashed. We're brain. looking at this. <laughs> so look at that. Somebody's texting me. <laughs> yeah. I just handed it to somebody. Patient oh, just wanted to come in and start talking about it. <laughs> um, uh, pro resolving mediators are a great choice to decrease the inflammation in the brain. Fish oils, mm. omega 3 fish oils. We talked about biotics. They've got a great triglyceride form of fish oils. Outstanding. In addition to that, um, I'm a big proponent of glutathione. Um, choline, vitamin D, zinc, methylated B vitamins. So if you do that and you mix it with a ketogenic diet, a low carbohydrate, high fat diets, fats are critical elements. They are pure energy, the best form of energy for the brain. Get off your carbs. Your brain is 60 to 70% fat. Get off your carbs. Start feeding a good quality fat. Start looking to ketogenic diet if you want to avoid some of neurodegenerative diseases. Remember, we always used to call Alzheimer's up to a few years ago, diabetes type number three. You're going to get diabetes from consuming too many carbs. Um, the ketogenic diet, when you go into ketosis, also makes ketone bodies. And those mm -hmm. ketone bodies are great energy. And they're great energy not only for the brain, but stimulating something. I'm going quick. I know brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Mm -hmm. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Let's do it. Brain yes. Derived, yes. <laughs> they are protein enzymes that come from the gut that go to the hippocampus. Brain-derived neurotrophic factors allow for brain neurogenesis. Brain neurogenesis, as of 2013, finally everybody agreed that nerves can go back in your brain. The brain is plastic. It's formable. Nerves can come back. Brain neurogenesis, BDNF, a great, great choice. Hence the idea of positive neuroplasticity. <sighs> yes. Yes. We have, a, we have an article written about PDNF on feedofbrain.com mm. forward slash BDNF. Um, there are so many ways that you can increase BDNF 
And yeah, let's let's do it. We're talking. We're talking exercise. I know that we we just talked about exercise. Turmeric. Turmeric. What else? Alpha-lipoic acid. La. Ketone bodies. Yeah. Probiotics. Prebiotics. Low level laser therapy. Nice. Those are some of the things that raise BDNF. Nice. Nice. And yeah, I, I did want to uh, come in. Some that that irks me, and it might just be me, but the ketogenic diet it annoys me because it's like, no, that guy's practicing the glucose diet. I'm practicing the ketogenic diet. Like nobody says that. I love that the glucose diet. Right. <laughs> because, I love like, it. I'm writing it down. Hold go on. For it, go for it. <laughs> so it's like the ketogenic diet. It's it's ketogenic metabolism. We're not eating ketones. Okay. So what are you eating, right? Like. What are you eating in that ketogenic metabolism? You're utilizing ketogenic metabolism, which is using ketone bodies, which are formed by the liver from fat consumption and low carbohydrate consumption. And those ketones can fuel the, body, the brain and the body beautifully. So what are you eating in this ketogenic diet? And this is where like, like feed a brain can absolutely be ketogenic. Um, it's also, I don't think ketogenic is appropriate for everybody all the time. I think several things need to be in place for, for going on a carb restricted, uh, high fat diet. However, if you can do it, man, is it good for your brain. Yeah, keto is great because of fat. The things that will put you in ketosis quick, the fatty fruits, avocado, coconut, olive, no doubt about it, MCT oil, which is a, an extraction of coconut oil, C8 and C10, great choices for brain health. C12 is coconut oil. It's lauric acid, but it's kind of slow to your brain energy. Great to take, better antimicrobial. So those are three things that come uh, – to mine right away. Other great choices are fatty fish or what we call smash fish, salmon, mackerel, um, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Omega-3 fatty acids, great. Take that supplement without question. Great choice of nuts, avoiding peanuts, which are too high in inflammation. Peanut is in a nut. It's actually a cousin to a legume. We don't want to go there. So nuts, you got your pistachio, you've got your macadamia, you got your cashews, you got your almonds, all raw, stop. Don't buy them and say, well, we cook them with something. They usually cook them with canola oil. Mm -hmm. Not a good choice. Your olive oil is omega-9, great choice. Your coconut oil is great choice. Whole eggs, wow. Grass-fed beef and eat your assortment of vegetables, your green and your green leafy vegetables. And what happened to carbohydrates? Well, when anybody can find an essential carbohydrate, give me a call. <laughs> Until then, we have essential fats, we have essential amino acids. I know you're busy. I know we've been taking a lot of time. So I've been on fire with that. So I'll wait for you. Oh, we're good. We're good. Sorry we're good. You're, you're, all, you're all good. It's great. One more thing on carbohydrates I'll share. It just hit me. Think about how. Our, our ancestors, were they able to eat carbs and fruits? No, they were only able to eat fruits for four months a year during the harvest time. And the other thing they could have gotten was honey. But let me tell you something, I don't stick my hand there in that honeycomb, you know why? Because the bees protected. So we were only supposed to eat them a small period of time to manifest in the summer so we could manifest, I'm sorry, to eat in the summer to manifest in the winter. So carbs are the treat, Keep them low. Keep your fat and proteins high. Mm -hmm. Everybody will be healthy. Boom. One thing that surprised me when we were when when you were giving your presentation is you talked about um, some foods to avoid, including spinach. Yes. Well, spinach yes. only to avoid if you have a traumatic brain or a concussion injury. Okay. Because spinach, there's something called acuporines. Acuporines are the water channel, ionic water channel in and out of the brain. There are four foods, this will be interesting to you, there are four foods that mimic an acuporine. Spinach being one of them, the other one were corn, tomato, and soybean. But you may not eat those, but the spinach is a very popular uh, in that. Popeye ate spinach. 
But here you have this brain damage, uh, excuse me, you've got traumatic damage to your brain and you're eating green leafy spinach and what it's doing is it's damaging it and it's causing neurodegeneration on the inside of your blood brain barrier to something called your astrocytic end feet, which is sort of the support cables for your blood brain barrier and the aid in development and structure. So spinach, yes, no spinach after traumatic brain injury. Gotcha. All right. So aquaporins, um, mm -hmm. the spinach, spinach, corn, soy, tomato, they all mimic uh, aquaporin Correct. channels. What, so aquaporin, yeah, they are, the actual aquaporins, they're, they're actually mimickers of water channels. Okay. And what aquaporins, they, they somehow damage the astrocytes, which make up the blood brain barrier. Correct. They, they're a support of the blood brain barrier and right. astrocytic end feet you don't want to damage. We're getting real technical again. Yeah, that's true. Out here. I love it. But, this the, is why, is, yeah. but it, the, the bottom line is after traumatic brain injury, spinach can damage the blood brain barrier from the inside. So we want to avoid it after that. Gotcha. All right. All right. How long after a brain injury do we want to avoid spinach? Well, you know, it's interesting. You should always test the blood brain barrier and you should fix it. And I don't think, when was the last time any of our listeners went and got their blood brain barrier checked? When was the last time any of our listeners went on a protocol for the blood brain barrier? Probably 99% of them have it. So it's a great thing to test for. I'm big, one of the first things I like all my patients to come in is test for barriers and test for food activity and to test for inflammatory status. Once we get that, we have a great baseline, and then we do the lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes including diet, mm -hmm. exercise, stress, ergonomics, and of course, nutritional supplementation. Awesome. So how, let's talk about testing for the blood brain barrier. Sure, there are a couple of companies, and I'm not gonna say which ones because we're trying not to push any particular oh. company. There's several companies that test for blood brain barrier function, and they're able to ascertain is it in place, is it recently damaged or has it been damaged over a long period of time? That would be number one. There is without question a cornucopia of companies that can test you for food allergies and their specific lab tests, all the interleukin, C-reactive protein, uh, calcium binding S100 that can tell you your inflammatory status. Hemoglobin A1C, hemoglobin A1C, which is a diabetic marker, will tell you the status of your brain health. So there's plenty of markers there, but the problem is you need to go to someone who's a little more eclectic than looking at the body as a whole and not just rabbit holing or pigeon holing like a cholesterol or a blood sugar. You got to look at the whole thing and you have to look a little wider now. So I say sometimes, you know, you're going to the doctors and they're too myopic. They need to be more like a quarterback. They need to have that peripheral vision to see the whole field. Love it. All right, well, here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to pause. So also in the, the, uh, the, at the Epic Conference, you talked about how glutathione decreases brain inflammation by 70%, which is awesome. You know, we talked about antioxidants. Um, well, during the Epic Conference, you talked about antioxidants in food. And then you talked about how glutathione just like is way, 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 way more. And um, I know that N-acetylcysteine is a rather inexpensive way to, to bring the precursor to glutathione into our systems. And I was wondering how effective that is. I think it's effective, but I think better. we're better off using either a liposomal or L-glutathione reduced so it's protected. So when you use all the precursors, a lot of times – it takes a longer period of time. If you took straight glutathione, it would be killed in the stomach acid. However, when you put it together, it takes a little longer. So I like GSH, L -glutath GSH as a great product to make glutathione. With that being said, glutathione does decrease brain tissue damage by 70%. It is the master antioxidant, and it is one of the top five choices for overall brain health because it not only aids in phase two of detoxification, it also stimulates the NRF2 antioxidant pathway, which is the rocket ship for antioxidants. Bam, bam. All right, so how does this tie in? I know Dr. Rob has a gut matrix. Yes. Can you tell me about that? 
The gut matrix in every grammatic manner is we all talk about the gut. The gut should be healthy. When it's perm semi-permeable, it's fine because what's passing should be passing like food, water, and specific nutrients. When it becomes too permeable, we get something called leaky gut. Leaky gut is usually due to something called dysbiosis, an unleveling of good and bad bacteria. That unleveling of good and bad bacteria can lead to the expression of LPS. The expression of LPS outside the gut lining is called endotoxemia. This leaky gut puts an incredible increase of toxins in a bloodstream on the way to the liver. 75% of the toxins in, that get past your gut go to your liver via the bloodstream, 25% go through the portal vein. Leaky gut, higher instance of toxic chemical overload to your liver. Leaky gut, higher incidence of prediabetes, diabetes, insulin resistant, and obesity because it's inflammatory. Your gut is needed to absorb nutrients and it's the house for not only autoimmunity, but inflammation. Leaky gut, increase to autoimmunity, leaky gut, autoimmunity, thyroid. Leaky gut, increase of something called cytokines, inflammatory markers, MMPSs, leaky gut, damage to musculoskeletal injuries, disc injuries, rotator cuff, leaky gut, leaky brain, LPS, increase of LPS, three times the incidence of heart attack. And last but not least, leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky brain, leaky gut. Increased neural degeneration, gut on fire, brain on fire, brain on fire, gut on fire. Whew. So, all right, we just opened up a Pandora's box. That's, I, that's I my, got that's you. That's podcast got, number two. Yeah, right? Basically, everything is connected, and it all starts with digestion, which is what we talked about earlier. You know, it's right there. Um, do we have time for you to tell us about the seven R action step? Let me hit you with the seven R actions for core. All right. So the seven R, my seven R action step, which is coming out in my new book, the super highway to health, November of 2019. This is a labor of love. I, it's my love because I get to share all that we talked about and more with everybody out there. So I know we'll be talking about it. I know you're going to carry it, and I greatly appreciate it. The seven are very simply. It's the best way to attack your gut health. Number one, what you want to do is you want to reset. What do you want to reset? Your lifestyle. Reset your lifestyle, your, your mindset. Start exercising. Get resistant exercise. Get flexibility training. <clears throat> you love the ketogenic diet? Hit some MCT oil. Get some fiber and magnesium in there. Number two, R number two, very simply remove. When I say remove, those dietary changes are removing necessary things, anything you're allergic to. And then adhere to my GPS, gluten, processed food, sugar, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweeteners, remove those. That's another instance. And number two is to remove all those environmental toxins that we talk about. That's a great time to detox. Also remove, you want to get rid of your bad bacteria. How do you do that? There's specific things to do to use to remove your bad bacteria. Berberine, berberine HCL, great choice to remove the lower bowel. Oregano oil, an emulsified oregano oil is a great choice. Removes your airway bacteria. Get some garlic, Allison garlic, great. It's your natural antimicrobial. SBI, serum bovine immunoglobins, or dairy free immunoglobins that actually remove the antigen before they pass the gut. That's number two. Number three, replace. Replace with what? Digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes like betaine and, uh, uh, be betaine and um, oh my God, I'm having a brain moment. And HCL, right. stomach acid, there we go. And in addition, get your pancreatic enzymes, amylase, protease, and lipase. Number four, rejuvenate your gut. Repair, heal and seal your gut. Specific nutrients like glutamine, okra, glucosamine HCL, things of that nature, fish oils, vitamin D, alpha lopatic acid will help take a micro environment in your gut, a health micro environment of your gut, and also heal and seal your gut. Number five, re inoculate. Re inoculate with good quality probiotics, lactobacillus acidophilus. Um, S. Barlardi, Saccharomyces Barlardi, Bifidobactam 07, um, Longum, things of that nature. Number six, 
we're going through it. Number six, you want to retest and then reintroduce. So hopefully you've got medical outcome at that point. So now you want to reintroduce foods because you may have had a leaky gut that caused food allergies. Then finally, if you've done all these and you know what you can eat, you want to retain your gut health by always having a good quality lifestyle, trying to eat organic foods, taking a good quality multivitamin, a fish oil, vitamin D, probiotic, and a good greens, like a nitro greens, a good fruits and greens drink. I love it. Those are great. So I did miss the very, very, very first one. What was that? Reset. Reset. And say, say that one more time. Reset. No problem. So what you want to do is you want to reset your lifestyle. Okay. Resistant exercises, flexibility training, uh, stress modification. Then you also, you may want to consider MCT oil, magnesium, fibers. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, man. It's been my pleasure. Robert, it's been, it's been just an amazing experience um, interviewing you here. I am really looking forward to us staying in touch. Absolutely. And we're, we're going to find much more. When your book comes out in November, I would love to have you back on here. I will be there for you. Nice. Let's do it. Let's well, do it. It's been my pleasure. And don't forget. As Jim Rome said, take care of your body. It's the only place you have to live. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Absolutely. Anytime they need me, my handles are real simple. Uh, drrobertsilverman.com. Um, come follow me on Facebook, Instagram. We do the whole social media deal. We got our own podcast, Proof and Health Alternatives, which you're going to be a guest on. Nice. And we're going to go from there. Nothing awesome. more to say, but take care of your body, man. Take care of your health. It's and have the only home you got, baby. Thank you so much. So that's it. That was kind of like drinking from a fire hose at the end there, I know. Um, I highly recommend going back and listening to some of that. Everything he said is right on. It's just, he just, you know, boom, boom, boom. Just laid it out super quick. So listen to that. If you have any questions, reach out. Um, and we will have him back on soon. Also, I'd love to know what you think about doing another podcast that's higher level. So let me know what you think. Reviews always are awesome, and I'll send you a book if you leave me a review. And so much appreciation to you guys. Thanks a bunch. Adios. Someone take me to a doctor.